Far from perfect with me. <laughs> All right, so here I am again with uh, Muses with Musos. Uh, we've got John Smetty Smethurst, who's just finished on stage at Den Divine's open mic night. Um, so Muses with Musos, uh, Smetty, just trying to get insight on the life of a musician and um, sort of gain inspiration for those viewing at home if they may be a bit timid to get on stage or. They're a bit too lazy perhaps to pick up a guitar and try and find some inspiration one way or the other. Um, but if you can just share a bit about your background and uh, how you got involved in the music industry to start, that'd be great. Okay, so um, my background comes from uh, when I was in high school, I sort of got into student theatre a little bit and I love doing that, I love performing. So I guess I had a natural propensity for, for and another guy you know here, Nigel Baker, we did theatre together at school. Oh and really? Yeah, and wow. uh, and uh, then when we sort of left school, we were interested in music a little bit, so in the 1970s, mid-1970s, we made up a couple of bands and painted our faces with makeup, did all sorts of weird stuff, just a la kiss. Uh, no, not really, more just split ends, more, right. more so, and, um, but just silly stuff that we did for fun. Yeah. And um, then uh, around 1976, 77, when punk music started up, it, it opened a uh, pathway, a gateway for people like me who couldn't really play very well. And, um, and I, I just decided, decided to start writing songs. And I wrote songs and I wrote material about reflecting the people around here. And um, we entered ourselves into a thing called the Battle of the Bands at the time, about 1978. And we came second and the band who won the, 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 the prize, first prize was a trip for two people to Hamilton Island. And the duo won it because <laughs> you couldn't, a band couldn't go on. <laughs> it was a funny thing. Anyway, so there was only two tickets. Yeah, there was first and second, and um, yeah, two two tickets for two people. So how many in the band? Four. Of yeah, right. So you couldn't have um, like, you couldn't have given it to you. You just figure out the rest. <laughs> anyway, so but we did really well, and that opened the door for us to a place. There used to be a place called the Playroom at Talabudra, and. Um, the, the lady who ran that was named called Beryl Carnell, and we became you know, sort of um, favoured favoured sons there a little bit, and did a lot of supports with big acts coming through, and um, we used to play the Miami Hotel. There was a number of gigs that used to be in Surface Paradise, the Paradise Room. There was um, the play playroom at Talabudra. There was the Miami Hotel, which became the Shark Bar. Then down to Coolangatta, there was the Jet Club and the Patch. And they were the sort of the five or six places where bands could play and, and get support slots. And we got paid. We got paid, we got 100, 100 bucks each a night to play supports. Bands can't get paid $100 a night now for the whole band. It's interesting, right? Because obviously you're a Gold Coast local and you, you just hinted about changing a landscape of music, and, yeah. given that we're uh, you know, in more modern time, you'd expect that to go up. Uh, obviously, being from the venue side of things, the venues have challenges in getting their right money for what they put into the venues. Yeah. Um, it's, I've always considered it to be kind of, um, I don't know if the word ironic's uh, the right word, but the fact that hospitality venue owners struggle, musicians struggle, they go hand in hand together. <laughs> Um, well, little pokies showed up, and that really, they really, you know, right. um, people who own venues <coughs> decided they could do better out of pokies than they could out of people paying to come and see bands play. And um, <coughs> now, with the remodeling of the Miami Hotel, it's a big, rest big restaurant now. Yeah. You know, it couldn't couldn't stay a dive forever. It was a bit of a dive in the end. But um, I think the shifting times through the late '70s and into the early '80s, with uh, no, the band that I was in was called Rat Pack, and. Um, we, we were fairly successful, quite popular to a degree around here. And it was a pretty brave step to start writing songs. And I wrote songs about the people who were in front of me. So I was kind of being quite cryptic in, in many cases. But um, after that, I went to um, England for a year in 1980, uh, hang out in the music, the music scene in London. And then when I came back, formed another band called Seven Ballerinas. Seven Ballerinas. We recorded single out, we played a lot on Triple J, Triple Z in Brisbane, Triple R in Melbourne. We toured, we played all original music, and we were kind of a new new wave band, I think they called them at the time. So, with you going over to London, and obviously being a Gold Coast local, 
What's the comparison between the industries? Well, England is so, England still is. If you've been to London or you go to London, you go out at night time, you've just got the choice of so much you can go and see and do. Um, yeah, it was like, wow. Yeah. Really organised. Like, I really dug the way in London, the tube finished at that time, finished, I think, the last tube was at 11. Quarter to 12 or something, so everybody could get home. So all the venues finished up at about 10:30, 11 o'clock, so people could get to the tube station to get home because because um, London cabs are so expensive, no one could afford to get home in a cab. So you had to get the tube home if you wanted to get home anyway. It's pretty cool. But London was, yeah, it was still hanging over from the punk scene. There was a lot of punk influence and um, a lot of arty people and fashion and everything is just wow well, compared to the Gold Coast Gold Coast. In 1980 I think I think I looked because I, I took a year and travelled around Australia in 1978. I think the population of Australia was 12 million people in 1978. And um, so 1980 there couldn't have been more than 12, 13, 14 million people at best. And um, you go to London there's 12 million people there on a Friday night. Yeah. Um, What's a, a song or an album or an artist that's just like been so instrumental in the way that you've constructed your musical life? I, I can't say really that there's this one particular record that did that. Um, my dad was a bit of a musician and so I kind of was surrounded by music all my life. Even as a kid. I remember seeing a, he, my dad had spiked up, you know, flat top haircut and big horn rim glasses and I remember seeing Buddy Holly on TV in about 1958-59 and thinking, gee, he looks like my dad, or is that my dad on TV? Um, I think the Sex Pistols album, never mind the bollocks, was a, a big change for anybody who kind of listened to that music. The Sex Pistols changed a lot and everything kind of flowed out from there. Um, but through the early 1980s, like Joy Division was the band that influenced me and the music most, most of all. And I, I found find myself now when I'm playing, sometimes I just fall a little bit back into the way that I was in Rat Pack and, and Seven Ballerinas. I can't help but kind of move, you know, it's like I tense up or I, I hit the guitar hard or I do something and I think I could be just playing nice and gentle music here but I tend to feel the, feel the energy. I, I always felt that. Um, I think it comes through with what I do. What, what I do now too, it's still the same. It never, it never leaves you when you've got that energy. It's a lively venue behind you at the moment. It's, uh, it's people everywhere. <laughs> That's the Enjoying way you the want festivities it. on a Tuesday night. That's the way you want it. Uh, exactly. Um, but Joy Division and the Sex Pistols were the two bands most influenced me, I reckon, in later years. Earlier years, you know, I was into all the same lame stuff everybody else, you know, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, Boss Skags and, and <laughs> just crap, just stuff that died because it had to die because young people got hold of music and injected it with, with power and passion and energy. Forever changing. Yeah. Uh, you got 35,000 people watching some DJ I'd never heard of the other day or watching on their phones. Outrageous. 35,000 35, phones saw more of the concert than all the people did. The money that turned over doing that. Oh, it's crazy. Incredible. Isn't that crazy? Paying someone that much money to, to watch them play play CDs. Or not in, are they playing they're CDs? Not even CDs anymore. No, they're just playing USB files. Stick, I'm just like, files. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't get it. And that many people. It's, um, I guess I pose a couple of questions. Like when it relates to this question, you've, uh, the challenges in the music industry. You've already talked about the money side of it. Um, you've talked about the forever developing, changing the way that music's played, and the seemingly lack of appreciation for real instruments. Um, I guess from a venue perspective, I've, I've seen a bit of nostalgia come back into live music lately because after COVID and all the challenges that we have with that, obviously that was a big challenge. Um, what's one of the biggest challenges you've ever faced in the music industry? One of the biggest challenges was in, 19, in the 1978, 79, struggling to get a gig in around Surface because that was our home, we were from Surface. I went to Surface Primary School when it used to be in the middle of town. And um, so we were real Surface boys and we couldn't get a gig. And the lady from the, the, the playroom, 
put us in contact with the guy who ran a, a, a gig in, in Surfers in Paradise Room and we got ourselves into there. But I, I was going to step back and say, there's a couple of things that really changed for young artists now. And that's the fact that everybody can have a recording studio at home on their, on their Mac or on their PC. It's me, I'm, I'm one of those. And uh, so you can create music and write write and create and, and get music out. Lob it onto YouTube, which I do. Um, anybody, everybody. Watch your YouTube channel if you want to plug it. Well, it's just John Spathos. <laughs> just, just my name. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a crap, it's a crap name. It's so long. I always try to explain how to spell it. Um, but that's, that's been a, a big change and um, like back in the day, in the late 70s and early 80s, if you didn't get picked up by a record company, you couldn't get near a recording studio. We did lots of recording, but it was all on downtime, free time. Like we, we had um, midnight until 7am in Paradise Recording Studios in Sydney. Midnight all had it booked out and we'd been touring using the Seven Ballerinas. We'd been using Midnight All's booking agency. And so we we were given the privilege of going, we could use the studio, we couldn't touch anything, and it couldn't touch any of their instruments if they left them around or anything, but we could use the studio and record in that space between 12 at night and 7 o'clock in the morning. So we'd play gigs and then go to the studio and record, for basically for free. We only had to pay for the recording tape. And um, that, well, that kind of worked for us. I think a lot of bands in, in, in those days, young bands, that's how they work. You, you sort of, you just got, you lucked into it really. And then the problem then is that you couldn't release the music properly because you didn't own the, you didn't own what was, you didn't own it. The recording studio people owned, owned the tape, kind of, and it was weird. So it's easier to make and produce your own music Absolutely, and release yeah. it. Yeah, think of. Um, um, Do you think that presents its own challenge, though? That um, yes. maybe there's an over flooding yes. of a flooding of. Yeah, it's so easy now. Yeah. It's not easy to do. It's yeah. technically quite difficult, but um, but yeah, it, it makes it so that it's but it's been a, it makes a level playing field. Anybody who's got some talent and ideas now can get it out. They can they can do it and publish it, put it on YouTube, and then it's there. But the next step is getting it to an audience is the big problem. You know, I've, I've got songs that I put up on YouTube that have had 500 plays. I've had I've got others on there that got 3,000 plays. But that's then I looked today and saw that um, uh, somebody that I like on there was uh, one and a half billion plays. Yeah. yeah, one and a half how billion. Do you, how, do you, how do you crack it? Yeah. How do you crack your arrow? Anyone on the watching this, how do you crack it? Yeah, I'd love to know. It's, 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 um, you need great management. The thing is, yeah. for, for both both those bands that I was in, in that, at that time, I was the manager. So we didn't have a manager. When you talk to record companies, they don't want to talk to people in the band. They need they need a filter. They need someone talking on behalf of the band, but not as part of the band. And that's probably still the same now. So the bands that did well were like in excess. Midnight All had a fantastic manager. Uh, in excess had an awesome manager. So any of the bands, Ch Cole Chisel had a great manager. These are bands of the times through the 80s and into the 90s. And with great management, they had they had a plan. But when you were just a, a band, they didn't want to talk to us because they're from the Gold Coast. Where are you from? Gold Coast. When are you moving to Sydney? Uh, we're not. We, we, we're just going to come in and out. Oh, no. They don't want to talk to you. It was really, really restricting. It was really tough, and we kind of we broke some ground because we refused to move and live in Sydney. We wanted to live here. We believed that we could do it that way, and we did up to a point. I don't think anybody. The only other band from around here that's done really well is Kings of the Sun. Two brothers called the Hope Brothers. They um they they, they got an American record deal. Um, no one else that I know of around here has gone gone that far. They've got an American record deal or produced records and got them played on radio in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane. Yeah, I guess it's funny with the perception of place, like you, you see with brands all the time, like everyone wants to have Burley on the label. They're not necessarily based in Burley, but they do it because of the name, they know it'll sell more. They're on Bondi, you know, Byron Bay. They're all they're also on those labels and they think somehow that makes you better um, but I think the Gold Coast 
in itself has, has it's obviously grown a lot over the last four years. It has 600, 700,000 people yeah. now. It's a city in its own right. Yeah, and um, I think with that as a, as a result, I think there's going to be a lot more um, availability for musicians. There's a lot more venues putting on music now. They see the benefit of it. Uh, unfortunately, none of them are dedicated to uh, music. Do you know who Split Ends were? Yes. Right. So you think about what it took for those guys in New Zealand, because they're from New Zealand, to do that, to dress like they dressed, do the whole bizarre thing, and then brave enough to back themselves and push it out there. That doesn't happen anymore. Nobody, any, no one now is game to take a risk and do something that would come in here and just blow everybody's socks off. Or anywhere. And, but, Catch 22, there's nowhere to do it now either. There's no playroom, there's no jet club, there's no patch, there's no paradise room, there's no Bombay Rock. They've all gone. You're, you're kind of in a vanguard of trying to, on a tiny stage. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's bloody hard.